Well, as I promised, uh, three very different takes on the idea of land icon nation. So please uh, take a breath, uh, gather your thoughts, and uh, fire away. Um, thank you so much for that amazing panel. That was a really, really great array of opinions. My question is for Dr. Phillips. So I'm wondering, um, as I was walking through the grounds yesterday, I saw the music and car piece, a place where they cried. And I'm thinking about this exhibition um, as built on the astute observation that land and landscape are two separate constructs that are, um, that are related. But I'm wondering specifically about the role of water within land and within the indigenous imaginary, what the role of water is, and do you view it as a separate space outside of land? Because what we're looking at within the exhibition um, is mostly kind of a land-based um, landscape. And so I'm wondering what your opinion on water is. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Um, and it actually did occur to me when I was preparing this presentation because, as I say, I, I'm seeing the world from my own place, the Great Lakes, more and more these days. And um, I have recently done a project on rock art, which I alluded to in what I said. But it came up in, in, other, uh, in, the, in the other presentations as well. And even here at Crystal Bridges, which, which is built over water. <laughs> I, but to, to respond more directly, in my understanding of indigenous cosmologies, um, the surface that we see is a, both of water and of land is a kind of continuous surface. But depending on the environment that any given people address and deal with and live with, um, you will get more of an emphasis on these worlds beneath and the worlds above either, let me say this better, my understanding of these indigenous cosmologies is that there is a world underneath the surface that we see, whether it is of water or of land, so that the, the mystical um, connectedness that is sought in traditional spirituality emphasizes accessing these powers beneath, and they can be powers of what we think of as land animals. The great bear, for example, is an incredibly important figure across the whole subarctic, including into Siberia. Whereas if you live in a, in a, a place on the edge of water, such as the northwest coast, you, you, will, you will conceive of a world beneath the surface of that water, which is a sort of in, inverse world of the, of the world on top of the surface. So I don't see them as conceptually different in terms of the cosmological linkages that people seek in traditional spirituality. But they, it, you do have a, a variation depending on the environment that you live in and the forces that you need to imagine or conceptualize. I hope that answers the question. Thank you for that. And um, I really enjoyed Professor Sullivan's emblematic readings. I think that that adds to what we've been looking at since, for example, in Velasco's paintings, there are so many sort of small genre scenes in the front or on the side. And they often get overlooked in terms of discussing like the synoptic panoramic view, but you know, audiences at the time would have focused on those small details, you know, those narrative details. And my question really comes is for Alberto because I I don't quite understand, and I think this is, you know, this is a problem dealing with in my own dissertation, how the city fits into our discussion of landscape. And I find that every time I try to describe what my research is on or what my peers are doing, that is a, that's a continued question. Like, is the city a landscape? And if it's not, then what is it? So I wanted to bring that up. All right. Now it's working. <laughs> <laughs> That was a problem that we had when we started the, the, the collection, the exhibition. Because in, the, in Mexico, as, as you saw, we, have, we had a, a strong uh, tradition of, of building of depiction. So for us, landscape is, if you have an urban landscape, that's landscape for us. It, it works for us in, in our way. Maybe from us histor art historians, we take it. We, we take the. We what we cannot do is to separate the cities and the people from the nature. It's not like in, for example, in in, 
in the northern, you, you, you see landscape as, as, as that, no? We cannot, we, we see it as that and this building and the people who is over there. That's the way in Mexican <coughs> historians see, see the landscape and that's because all the, if, if you see all the, Mex all the products, the, the, the pictures that came in, in 50, 500 years of Mexican landscape, they are <coughs> full with people, with, with, uh, with buildings, and, <coughs> and with nature, of course. No? So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's the way we saw it, and it's, it, it has been very interesting to, to learn for me that a uh, European uh, landscape is not a landscape for, for you Americans. You're, I don't know, you're <laughs> the crazies are you, not, not us. <laughs> well, I don't know if it answers the questions, more or less. And <clears throat> about the, the figures in the Landesio San Velasco, I, I just want to say that for, for Landesio, the figures were, were very important, as important as the, uh, as the whole scenery. They were not staff, staffages. You, you have this word in English, that is staffage, right? I, I pronounce it right? Well, that staffage, we don't have that in Spanish. Mm -hmm. For us, that's not staffage. This is, that, that's, the, that's the episodio. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> so you, can, you, you have to, to understand our paintings of that year, period, you have to understand that those episodes for us are as valuable, uh, and for them who painted, as the trees and as everything over there. So. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers something. Graham. PJ. Um, I was particularly struck, uh, Professor Sullivan, by your discussion of trees, which I, I think would make a magnificent subject for an exhibition in its own right. The idea of you know, sacred timbers marking the spot of, of important events. Um, and it got me you know, kind of thinking about American examples, the charter oak depicted by uh, Brownell and by Frederick Edwin Church and, and thinking about the, uh, the Treaty Elm, most famously depicted by Benjamin West. Um, and then, you know, thinking about it, it's a larger phenomenon, the Luther Oak in Wittenberg, Germany, which was planted after the fact to mark the spot where Luther burned the papal bull. I'm wondering, some of these trees are because something, are there, are venerated because, because something famous happened there, but some are planted as a sort of X marks the spot after the fact, and others then take on a broader symbolic meaning and carry that meaning to um, wherever they are. The Canadian maple leaf, for example, uh, which dons the lapel, adorns the lapel of every Canadian traveling abroad, nearly. Um, I wonder if maybe you've thought about breaking, kind of breaking down the, the uh, meanings of, of uh, these trees into different categories. Uh, very specialized question, I apologize, but I'm fascinated by, by the subject. Actually, it, I, I loved your comments, but you, you've really started to break down those categories yourself because <laughs> you know, trees that are planted in commemoration, uh, trees, I mean, uh, just the, the format, of the, the, the shape of the tree, the tree as a singular element that we can look at, uh, gather around, gather under, uh, and it provides shade and it provides sustenance. If it's, a, it's an oak tree, it provides uh, uh, nuts for animals and animals provide sustenance for humans. Uh, it, they are part, trees are part of creation myths, the, the myth of George Washington and the cherry tree, for example, uh, and virtually every uh, every civilization that I can think of, and this is not limited only to Western civilizations, but uh, the Bodhi tree, uh, from which, uh, in, in relation to the myth of Buddha, or the story of the Buddha, uh, is born under the Bodhi tree, out of the sleeve of his mother, Queen Maya. So the tree has a mythical and, one could say, mystical 
uh, connotation uh, in a wide variety of uh, wide variety of cultures. Uh, in the Americas, I've uh, you know I was concentrating my my thoughts about uh, about the Americas, but it seems to be a sort of half and half uh, within the uh, idea of sacred trees from uh, from Ur civilizations, from Native American, from uh, indigenous civilizations, which worship specific or worship at specific trees, and uh, on the other hand, uh, trees that become emblems, become the emblem of nationhood. So there are so many ways to read this and so many instances of artists uh, who are using uh, and continue to use the tree as one of the most uh, poignant and palpable uh, uh, elements uh, of nature to which we immediately were called tree huggers if we love nature. Uh, and so this idea of, uh, of, uh, of embracing ourselves within nature by uh, getting next to, close to, or literally hugging a tree. I mean, that sounds like a silly example, but I think it's a perfect example of how trees become part of the symbiosis between uh, humanity and nature and thus are the most appropriate uh, tools uh, for an artist uh, to use to uh, recommend or to reference uh, an emotional state. And I will be happy to organize an exhibition with you on the subject. <laughs> I, I asked if I could add a comment to that and I was given permission. I'm gonna channel Joseph Campbell for a minute here because I was also very struck by the, by the Seba tree. Um, I think this is a point of connection between the indigenous world, as you just suggested, and the, the settler imagery, which um, some people would say reaches back into a shared Paleolithic past and the, and the uh, development of shamanistic systems of belief. Because shamanism, everywhere you find it in the world, uh, posits a world axis, which unites the upper world cosmic zone with the world beneath the, the earth. The roots go into the earth, the trees reach up to the sky. And shamans orient themselves along these axes, which are often imagined as trees. So the, the fact that a Jesuit or a missionary would position himself in front of a tree is just further evidence of their extraordinary understanding of these things. Some people would say that the Christian cross is an axis mundi of the same sort. Snake below, bird above. One last question. I wanted to add that though it's a rich subject that has certainly inspired exhibitions in the past and should continue to do so, I curated an exhibition last year at Stanford University's Cantor Art Center exactly on this subject called Arboreal Architecture, A Visual History of Trees. And one of the things that I found quite interesting that I think obtains in this conversation is that trees in their symbolism, which is many, have um, a certain ambivalence as regards one of their most potent emblems, which is roots. And this is the conduit with which it makes direct contact with the land, symbolically the place where the peoples who worship or esteem these trees become physically and then spiritually connected with it. So the concept of roots, and in particular from Latin alphabetic languages, the, its etymology, racination, is a very interesting component of the way that landscapes begin to be read through trees in the 19th century as both the way of forming inclusive communities, but also of excluding certain foreign nationals who might be intruding upon their premises. So this is something I think is, it, I, I was reminded of it, for example, in the portrait of McKinley, who if you recall, um, as was going through a recent news cycle, his name has been effaced from the mountain in Alaska, Denali National Park, um, to much contention. So as part of the sort of effacement of indigenous um, peoples within the United States in particular, and that might also be the case in South America, I think further evaluating the concept of roots as both inclusionary and exclusionary as having this double-edged sword is an important thing to keep in mind. Thank you for that comment. Um, and thank you to the speakers for their brilliant talks and all of this great discussion thus far. Thank you.